Yeah, and the drive, I was just beat. This is why I hate jury duty, bro. Like, I don't, I don't, I honestly, because yeah. you've been up super early. Like, how are you still kicking? Well, not yet, but I got, I have, I've been telling people about Magic Mind and Brett. If you go back and you've been watching long enough, you see Brett tell me about this and him and Lonnie take it. And it's like, I, I couldn't come back and just do coffee. Okay. So I want like, it's like a clean energy drink. Okay. And it like, you'll see, because people have been watching the show. I do a quick one, tastes like orange juice. Good God. Uh, yeah, one shot. One, one shot. <laughs> but it's it's great. It doesn't give you no shakes. Hmm. As I said, it's kind of clean energy. As Brett says, adaptogens. Um, but it's... Uh, <laughs> But it's 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 really I use it for stand up comedy, um, and it especially knowing that I was going to do a show later at night with you, mm. I said, um, yeah, I got a, a magic mind. Let's do it. So they've been part of the show for a little bit. I'm glad to have them, and I really want people. I'll give you some before yeah, you leave. I would love so to try it, man. They're great. So, and if they people want it, you can get into the link in the description. So, all right. I didn't even realize we were going to shoot right now, so that's great. So people should get Magic Mind. It's amazing. Link's in the description. Let's get to our show. Let's do it. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Capes and Cows. It's big thing. It's Friday. It's our weekly comic book movie news show where we go over the latest and greatest in the news of the comic book movie world. And there's quite a lot to talk about today, man. The trailer for... This morning it dropped the trailer for The Penguin, The Max Show, the continuation of The Batman by Matt Reeves, the tone, very Sopranos-esque. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is it going to scratch that itch as we wait for The Batman to return in 2026? What say you? What say my panel here today? That's an anticipated show, and an anticipated movie that's coming out is Deadpool, man. Deadpool and Wolverine. Well, there's uh, rumors as far as what the when we're going to get the next trailer. There's also rumors about multiverse. And are these things going to really reset the Marvel Cinematic Universe as we think? I mean, even in that teaser, it certainly seems that that's the way it's going. No, what Nobody knows where it's going. Is the next Spider-Man movie. Tom Holland, what's he doing? Is it going to be a small-scale, street-level Spider-Man, or is it going to be another big multiverse? Well, if it's up to Kevin Feige... Rumor has it that he wants it to be street level. Sony wants it to be bigger. Sony wants it faster, wants it sooner. And there seems to be a lot of butting heads. That's the latest report. So what's that going to be? What's that going to look like? Um, and what did look like, I thought, an okay trailer. Boy, were we wrong. Um, for whatever everybody else says when it came to The Crow. Ooh, people hated that trailer. And it's like super disliked. And Alex Proyas, who directed the original film, he spoke out about it. One of the actors spoke out about it. So we'll talk about all that uh, today on the show with me, Winston and Coy. So if you're brand new to the channel, hit that subscribe button, man. Trying to get to 200,000 faster than we got to 100. We're getting a lot of new people in here. We do long form podcasts like the one you're listening to right now or watching right now. We do uh, out of the theater reactions. We do non spoiler reviews. We do spoiler reviews. We do a whole ton. On this channel. So we hope that you'll join us. Okay, it's Capes and Cows. Let's do it. It's a big thing. Here we go. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Capes and Cows. Myself, Coy, Winston. We are back in one form or another. We are back. Um, and it's good to see you guys. How are you doing? I'm cold. Oh, yeah. You're you're <laughs> you're in the East Coast. I just got out of it. It's cold. It was like when I left, it was like 39, 40 degrees. Where how about for you where you're at right now? Uh I I it's in the, the 30s, 20s. Okay. It's like kind of fluctuating a little bit. Yeah. Um it's supposed to get up to 41 today. Ooh. Well, yeah, like that's that's <laughs> people who are wearing shorts. We had a blizzard on St. Paddy's a couple times. You're you're in my home turf. It is not a place to be if you are warm blooded. Nope. Um, well, we're uh, well. Coy and I are back in in LA. We Winston's freezing <laughs> his balls off. So we um we are going to be talking about a few things here, guys. Because as I said, there was a couple things that dropped, and and there might have been some things that I might have missed. Because like I said, I was out of uh, town for the last couple of days. So if there is, um, we can fill that in. But let's start with what dropped today. The Penguin. That show looks like a banger. Um, the Penguin trailer teases the next chapter in the Batman saga as Oz 
makes his move from comic book movie, writes a new trailer for the Batman spinoff. The Penguin has been released, and it puts the spotlight on Colin Farrell as Oz, making his desire to bring Gotham City under his control known. Max has released a new trailer, and it confirmed it premieres on the streaming service this fall, starring Colin Farrell as Oz Cobb. That's what the press release names him anyway. The eight-episode DC Studios drama continues the Batman epic crime saga that filmmaker Matt Reeves began with the Warner Brothers Pictures global blockbuster, The Batman, and creators of the character played by Farrell in the film, and centers on the character, excuse me, played by Farrell in the film. So the trailer itself, it drops... And I absolutely love this trailer. I thought it looked, to me, exactly like it carries on into that Matt Reeves universe. And I thought that it also um, was, you know, I was hoping, and I mentioned this in my my reaction, when Jon Favreau was pitching the the, um, Boba Fett series, he was saying it's like the godfather of of Star Wars. And it, it ultimately wasn't. It was a good pitch, but it ultimately wasn't. And because you had, uh, you had Boba Fett was just like a good guy. This looks like a full-on gangster series right where The Sopranos left off, and it shows the rise to power. I loved it, but I'll start with Winston. What do you think about it? I mean, I, you know, Colin Farrell is one of the more talented actors we've seen in the last couple of decades, and I completely lost Colin Farrell in yeah. Penguin in The Batman. Like, he, to me, was probably the highlight of the film. Uh, in a film that had a lot of really good stuff, like Paul Dano was cooking for sure, but th- there was something very unique about Colin Farrell. So when this was announced, I was excited. And honestly, it just it feels like, oh, okay, we were already we already have momentum. We're just gonna keep the jog going, and and it looks it looks fantastic. So I'm here for it. Uh, Coy, what'd you think? I love seeing an actor get to act. I've always been a huge Colin Farrell fan, and I love that they're giving him the opportunity to play a character that isn't just handsome, womanizing Lothario. I feel like Colin Farrell, he's got that Brad Pitt thing where he's a uh, a handsome man trapped in a perfect body, but he wants to be a character actor. Like, his face is his curse. And because of the power of the Penguin prosthetics, you really lose him into the role, and you can let this impossibly handsome guy play this grotesque creature. So I know that a lot of people were upset. Uh, you know, they didn't just cast like a fatty, but instead they let this guy be like, you know, himself and embody this, this powerful malice. And I personally think um, this is what you need to build out Gotham, right? You need the opportunity to have long form storytelling build a world around Batman because Batman's so much more than just Batman. He's the Robins. He's his rogues. He's Gotham itself. And, you're not going to get to tell that in one movie. So I love the idea of, of bridging the Batman movies with a Gotham story. And in this case, doing the Sopranos, as you mentioned, doing the underbelly of Gotham, not just Batman's perspective, but what better way to see what Batman looks at from his, his ivory tower down on people than looking up from a penguin perspective. So to me, this captured all that. I love the monologue about what you want to be remembered for. I love the idea that basically crime is a way to leave his mark and Oswald Cobblepot is a broken man trying to feel important. He's someone that has always been kicked around that wants to be heard. So this, to me, in two minutes captured that and reminded us why Matt Reeves is the guy that needs to be making Batman stuff. Yeah, it was. It, it definitely felt right where the movie itself left off. And it does, because the Batman was pushed back to 2026, it kind of scratches that itch in general. And because of that delay, it looks like if this is the hit we think it could be, you might even get a season two of this thing that pops up before Batman comes out in 2026, which would also fill in, it would continue to scratch that itch because if this thing kicks ass, um, people are going to go, Oh, I want to see more of that. I want to see more of that. And then if they do, then you'll be like, Oh, Oh shoot. And the Batman comes out and you could pepper Robert Pattinson in there, which I think they're going to do at least in the first season, maybe put him in a little bit more in the second, if they get to it in time. And then you lead that into what Matt Reeves is doing. So Matt Reeves has this little separate universe. But to jump back to what you were saying, Coy, about Colin Farrell, the other thing that I had mentioned about him is that I know he's a big superstar. I know that he's a you know, a household n- name. But I think that he's one of the more underrated actors that are out there right now. He's never talked about in, you know, when every time you bring him up, you're like, oh, yeah, he's a really good actor. But you never, like, the first, he's not the first person you go to. When you're like, oh, so who are some of the great actors out there right now? If you throw his name in the conversation, people, yeah, yeah, I can see that, I can see that. But he's 
should always be mentioned in the conversation. I just watched the gentleman on the plane. Oh, yeah, dude. Where he played Coach Kavanaugh. He's, he, play, he basically played Connor's coach. He's he play, so good in that. No, he played Finstock is what he played. Uh, <laughs> um, and he was fantastic in that movie, but he's fantastic in everything. He's As Winston said, he's unrecognizable in this role. He really gets a hold of what this tone is all about. Every time he was in the Batman, he stole the, he stole the scenes. So Each I, of his eyebrows yeah. and in Bruges is better than most actors can be all year. It's like true. He is, he is a force. In, I mean, I, and I know like Banshees was much more my jam than yours, but even in a movie that like totally might not have been your thing, the power and the weight of the performance and the, the dichotomy of him being his nineties, like heart throbby self versus daredevil where he's like chewing the scenery versus Banshees. Right. He's, a sadness incarnate like there's so much weight to his performances so i personally love seeing that in a comic book setting so you can actually let there be some weight and gravity to comic book movies again yeah. i mean it's it's you know what the penguin kind of felt like to me is if you took him and in bruges and you uh fuse that with him and horrible bosses <laughs> so yeah but so genuine yeah, right. is the idea of you're throwing this prosthetics and you're having him be ridiculous but he is such a talented actor. Yep. The ridiculousness becomes fully believable. Like as ridiculous as that character was in Horrible Bosses, so I was like, "Yeah, no, that's that's a real terrible, huge, horrible boss that we've all seen before." I felt the same way watching the Penguin. So again, if you're just going to give me more of what, in my opinion, was the best part of Matt Reeves as the Batman, I'm I'm here for it. And to be honest with you, if they pull this off correctly, this is what. The MCU has been trying to do since, um, you know, Agents of Shield, because they they started to kind of tap into that a little bit when when you had Winter Soldier come out and when you had Ragnarok, you did have some crossover from uh, some of the actors from the main films. If you can do this correctly, everything we've tried to see out of WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier and all that that feels like has just been a little bit off kilter should properly connect the this and just allow you like you said here's your halftime show before we get back to the super bowl type i really like that that point uh, i think there is a new era coming i feel like we've had an ebb and flow in comic book stuff right like we had the heyday of 2008 where it's like oh wow this is all new and it's incredible and then there was going into phase three where it felt like this big culmination i think as an optimist this ebb of quality and perspective and celebration of stuff where not everything has been hitting and sometimes more has been failing than succeeding and i and i talk about it a lot but i do think the uh, reports of comic book movies death have been greatly exaggerated but i think that what could happen from that is since marvel's restructuring since dc is aggressively like by default restructuring coming back it'll be stronger if things go well because there's less convincing the audience of the merit of these things. We have accepted mm -hmm. comic book movies' importance. We have accepted some of the more absurd visuals. So now if we come back and we're living in a world where Penguin can be this bridge between the Batman, where we're living in a world where Gen V comes out between the boys, then what Marvel wanted to do four years ago can come back better, and DC can be the one to go like, okay, look, we did this in live action. And then, like I said, the boys has already accomplished it. So with X-Men 97, I feel like we're seeing the benefits of the TV format more than we had necessarily every other time. So if we start to do what they tried to do four years ago, we get like long form on TV, big event in movies. Right. We slowed down, we come back stronger. This might be this next wave of like glory days. Yeah. I mean, it could be for sure. I mean, this is, and especially when this is an Elseworlds universe that's happening here, the only problem that DC could find themselves in is if that the, their DCU stuff isn't hitting that people might be going, why don't you just stop doing that DCU stuff and just do what Matt Reeves is doing because that's better. But the one question that I wanted to ask is I, I kind of, I think I'm going to ask this in the title and the thumbnail in general is that this show, could it wind up being one of the best shows of the year to, that crosses over past the comic book movie audience? Because will it actually scratch that itch of the gangster show that people have been looking for that it could bring in? You know, an audience that's like, oh, what is this? The Penguin Show? Like, well, I don't know. What the, yeah, but it's a gangster show, dude. It's like, yeah, I don't know. What do you think? It it can, but it's got some stiff competition. I mean, when when you're dealing with the world of Shogun, which has been crushing, House of the Dragon, House of the Dragon is coming back. The gentleman, uh, the speaking book, of the gentleman, 
the yeah. gentlemen. Uh, the boys will be back in a little bit. Exactly. Like, yeah, yep. if, if, as long as it's as long as it's all done well, then sure. But but you, as far as like let's win, like the Bear season three, I think comes out. As yeah, well. in June. That all comes out in June. But I'm just curious if it could be in the conversation. <laughs> yeah, everything you just listed is like June. <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious if it could be in the conversation of just because it be, because there's also the Bear obviously has its audience that is pretty wide. Um, House of the Dragons. House of the Dragon is another one that has its is kind of my point where House. I think House... this is a different tone. I think what you're what you're speaking to is the specific gangster tone, and I think its direct competition would be the gentleman. But I think uh, Matt Reeves he paints such beautiful. Him and Greg Frazier, the cinematographer, paint such broad tapestries on screen that I think this will appeal beyond comic book audiences. I think the Batman did so well because. We were fresh out of the pandemic and people were still going to see this because it felt new and exciting. It felt like what I see the Batman as in comic books, like this neo art deco noir goth masterpiece that will translate into a gangster story. I think this could be in the conversation at the end of the year as far as if they do what they did with the Batman, reinventing the wheel, but do it long form and you let Colin Farrell really flex right. his acting chops, this could be something like unique and special, especially in the medium. That's kind of what I meant where it comes to what Matt Reeves did with making it feel like you're watching a Fincher film. That, yeah. That this is like a, a full on gangster tone. But House of Cards with Penguin Man? Yes. Right. Right. All right. So what say you guys? Could this show be one of the biggest hits of the year? Did you like the trailer? Do you think that it could work? Do you think it's a good way to scratch the Batman itch? Put your comments in there. Let us know what you think. Now, before we move on, I wanted to tell you guys that. I'm excited you've been watching the show. You know that, and people always ask about our sponsors. We've got two great ones coming up right now, and that's AG1 and Factor. I love working with both of them. I'll tell you about both of them right now. All right, guys, let's talk about AG1. You guys know I love AG1. If you've been listening to my show, you've heard me talk about them, and I've been drinking them for about two years now, and I love it. Never been a vitamins guy. I've told you that. I take it all one shot, AG1. I put it in a water bottle. I shake it up. I'm good to go. I recommend AG1 to my friends. I recommend AG1 to my family, everybody. AG1 is a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science and maintains high quality standards. You guys know they've been with us for a while because you guys know too. You've all been checking them out and everybody who's been signing up to AG1 says the same thing. It's changed your energy. It's changed how you approach things in a day. You're smiling more, you're running around the place and you're sleeping better. I know. AG1 is the supplement that I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. And that's why they've been a partner for so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and you get a free one year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash big thing. Drinkag1.com slash big thing. Check it out. Excited to talk to you guys about Factor, man. You know, it's not always easy to eat better, but it is with Factor. Because they have delicious, ready-to-eat meals. It's every one of them is it's fresh. It's never frozen. It is chef crafted. It's dietitian approved, and it's ready to go. This is the best part. Two minutes. You'll have over thirty-five different options to choose from each week, whether it's calorie smart, protein plus, all of it. And there are more than sixty add-ons to help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day. What are you waiting for? Two-minute meals, and there's a lot of great stuff: pancakes, smoothies. There's no prep. There's no mess meals. It's flexible for your schedule. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast premium options with no cooking required. You just sign up and you save. You head to factormeals.com slash big thing fifty, but you gotta use that code big thing fifty. And what happens when you use big thing fifty? You get fifty percent off. That's big thing fifty at factormeals.com slash big thing fifty. And you get fifty percent off. All right, thank you to our friends over at AG1 and Factor. As I get and been getting people who have been signing up to both AG1 and Factor and telling me how much you love them. Um, please, if you want to support the show and you're able to and you have the means to, please consider them. I'll put the link in the description, and I always pin the sponsors as the first comment. All right, Deadpool and Wolverine. So we have a rough ETA on the second trailer, and now there's rumored details on the new multiverse concept. This is from a comic book movie. We may have an idea of what to expect, 
We might have an idea of when to expect a full trailer for Marvel Studios' Deadpool and Wolverine, and we also have details on a new multiverse concept known as the Anchor, Mark Cassidy. The Deadpool and Wolverine teaser that debuted during the Super Bowl in February gives us a long-awaited glimpse of some footage from the Merc with the Mouth's MCU debut, but it was clearly holding back a lot of things, including a first proper look at Wolverine in action. The full trailer is sure to give us a much better idea of what to expect from the threequel, while also spotlighting at least a couple, a couple more big reveals, and we may now know when our next look at the movie will be released. Though we don't have an exact date, Trailer Track believes that the second Deadpool and Wolverine trailer will be with us in early May, in time to screen in front of Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, which hits theaters this month. Last, sorry, later that month. Rumors relating to the movie's plot continue to run rampant, and we have a new one from Daniel, Daniel Rickman, which sh might shed some light on this new multiverse concept that we've been hearing about. According to the scooper, Deadpool and Wolverine will introduce something known as the Anchor. His explanation isn't the clearest, but as far as what we can tell, it means that when a multiverse variant is killed, presumably in the battle world-like area from the teaser and set photos, their world begins to decay until it vanishes from, vanishes from existence. Sounds like a similar concept to the pruning idea from Loki, and if accurate, could back up rumors that this movie will serve as a reboot for the sorts of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or at the very least, make some major course corrections to lay the groundwork for Avengers Secret Wars. The recent synopsis for the movie says, after facing some professional setbacks while going through a midlife crisis, Wade Wilson decides to officially retire Deadpool and becomes a used car salesman. But when his friends, family, and the whole world are at stake, Deadpool decides to bring his katanas out of retirement. He recruits an unwilling and wary Wolverine to not only fight for their survival, but ultimately their legacy. Okay, that's a, that's a lot. That's a lot. So, all right, let's start with you, Coy. You hear um, this, the fact that we're getting the trailer in May, movie comes out in July. That makes sense, right? Yeah, that all tracks. And I, and I do think they help things close to the vest for a reason. I think we talk a lot about how we're in a, kind of an insular bubble of, of too much awareness of these things. You have to let the mainstream audiences know what's going on. The Super Bowl, obviously, the best place to kind of announce Wolverine's coming back for people that didn't have that awareness. But holding out on showing him until the second trailer made me really happy because now this trailer is going to be huge as well. Because if they showed Wolverine in his full yellows, like they had that flash and we saw the cowl on the back of him bending over him, but we didn't see that moment. I think saving that for a trailer gives you two first trailers in its own way we got just enough story just enough conversation trailer broke the internet but now we've got the opportunity to do that again with new images and having the cameos perhaps and, and all those things so i think the marketing is going to be a strength of this film and saving some of that for for the second trailer is going to be exciting and as far as the synopsis i love that it's a blend of deadpool 2 synopsis which was all madness it was about a cow if i remember correctly this sounds like it's got some truth in it but it's also you know very much a ryan reynolds synopsis so uh i, I can't wait Winston? I mean, I this is probably it's probably my most anticipated film of the year. Okay. So I'm 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 very much paying attention to any and all news coming from it. And I think that that is probably good. I think you don't need to do anything other than this trailer in May and then maybe give a final tease, not a full trailer, but a final tease like the week or two before and call it a day. Because I think the thing that really that used to sell movies to us in the first place, but really sells Deadpool to us is that we don't know too much. Like part of what makes it brilliant is the fact that it is just Ryan Reynolds unleashed and we get to experience that for the first time when it actually happens. Right. The one thing I'm getting really scared about is that this new wave of, let me show you the whole film. I'm just like, please stop doing that. Right. So I, I, I genuinely hope that this next trailer, you go show us Wolverine, little bit more of an understanding of what's happening, but nothing crazy. I agree. And that's been a problem for a while that they've been doing. I remember even like they, they ruined the freaking first Avengers. It's the one I always bring up when Tony's fallen from the sky and you see Hulk saving him. I never understood why they, why they did that. Um, because I remember when, when he fell and I'm like, oh, so I guess this is when Hulk catches him from the tree. I, you know, I, I don't remember that from that trailer. So thank God, because it probably would have ruined that yeah, moment. It ruined I was it on me. the edge of my seat at that moment. Yeah, so. it ruined it for me. And they do that quite a lot. There was a movie recently that I can't remember what the hell it was. I was watching it with Ant-Man and Ant No, no, no. It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't comic book. That was, it was, it was it, that was bad, too. But it wasn't comic book. It was something I watched with my wife the other day. We were watching something. And I was like, yeah, check this out to see if you want to see this, this movie. And... It was the whole, it was essentially the whole freaking movie. And I was like, 
Oh, man. Oh, you know what it was? I went and I saw, that's what it was. I saw um, Arthur the King, that that dog movie, and I'd seen it already. And I was like, my family really liked this movie, but I don't think they know anything about it. So I showed him the trailer. And then when I showed him the trailer, I'm like, maybe it's just because I know it. But, like, this is the whole freaking movie. Like, it's the whole movie. They show the whole freaking movie. Um, and they do that a lot. I don't understand why they do it. There's certain moments, but I hope they don't do it with Deadpool. And I agree with you, Winston. I think that would be the best way. What they should do is you show the trailer, you show like the story, you show Wolverine, you show just the as the essence of what the movie's going to be about. So it's not too confusing, which leads into the multiverse side of it. Corey, you've been saying this forever, man. They're gonna. This is the way they're they're gonna kind of reboot it. What is a what is a reboot? Do you think? What do you think that looks like? Well, I I think uh, to to quell some fears about what's going on with the trailer i would worry if it wasn't for ryan reynolds being in charge of like his own marketing company i do think maximum effort his company is going to help keep this under wraps a little bit more than it might otherwise so i'm worried all the time trailer showing too much but i'm hoping, I'm hoping with him running it it might not um but multiversally i think this is going to bring us all of the spectacle and scope we wanted from doctor strange i think we're going to see a tease of that in the second trailer i think we will get a couple fox cameos to show that's plot based like i think we'll get some of the how the x-men come into play with the second trailer but uh multiversally i do see battle world and secret wars coming straight out of this movie and really showing what marvel's going to be post 2026 like if an act structure i think this is the beginning of the third act like i think we're gonna be going into it starting with deadpool all right so again what do you think guys do you think that this is going to be a great movie do you think the multiverse stuff is going to be explained pretty well? Are you excited for when the trailer comes out? What do you hope to see in it? Do you think it should be the last one? Or do you think they're going to make that mistake and put 75 different trailers out, 87 different TV spots? What do you think? Put your comments in there. Tell us. I think it's going to be the latter because they really are trying to throw that million, that billion-dollar dart at this thing. So they're going to try to get everybody, the mainstream audience, um, out there, the casual audience. So. Um, you know, I probably will. We'll probably watch as many as we. What, 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 what you got? I was just gonna say, if they're gonna, if they're really gonna push, then what they need to do, to be honest with you, is again trust Ryan Reynolds. And I don't know if people remember, but like, yes, there were a few trailers here and there for Deadpool, but most of the marketing was him as Deadpool doing random things. He'd be at like a car wash, and then he'd just be like, "Oh, I didn't even see you there." Like, it was like do that kind of marketing with this, and let Deadpool sell this movie, and not your trailers. Don't. F your trailers because you're going to end up spoiling the movie. Right. And just let Deadpool do what he does. And I guarantee you people would show up. Yeah, uh, I am I agree with you. I agree. So, all right. So put your comments in there and let me know exactly what you think. Love to get your thoughts on that. And before we move on to our next story, it's a shorter episode today. But before we move on, I want to tell you about our friends over at Zbiotics and Vessi. Here it is. Vessi. So, John, I got these. I got these new shoes. Um, and they have like, it's like rain wear. It's really, really, it's incredible. I love, they sent it to me a while ago, but I'm so excited to tell them about them. Like the, for us, we, I want to tell you that Vessi has like this innovative, it's like footwear and it's designed for spring weather. Um, it's great. So Stormburst Vessis are the ones that I really want to kind of emphasize. And they're your go-to for every setting, city streets to outdoor adventures, enhancing your style and activity with ease. So you can, whether it's snowy trails, wet streets, morning dew walk. So whether you're facing unexpected snow or slippery paths, it's so crucial in general to have these. Like I, I'm planning a move. I've talked about this, but it's been raining a lot in LA and I've been wearing my vesties everywhere. And I have, and you guys seen it. I've been wearing the one, the, the, the one hoodie that I have that they sent me. I love it. It's one of my favorite things. I love these hoodies. I've worn it on in, in so many different um, videos. They have all weather, all occasion footwear from beach days to snowy communities. They have so many different things. You should elevate your spring wardrobe when you travel with Vessi's Stormburst shoes. You can discover more at Vessi.com slash big thing. Get your pair today and get an automatic 15% off your first purchase at checkout and be ready to step out into style. It is great stuff. I love Vessi. I really, really enjoy Vessi. The other thing you want to check out is Zbiotics. And Zbiotics, thank God, I went to a wedding last night, and Zbiotics is the reason that I am able to be here with you today. Um, they are the maker of the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It, you got to take your first drink of the night for a better tomorrow. Fact. 
It's engineered by a team of microbiologists, and Zbiotics is a pro probiotic drink that breaks down the byproduct of alcohol, which is responsible for rough mornings after drinking. So you have a Zbiotic for the best results. You take your first drink of the night before you do anything else. You pace yourself, you hydrate, and you get a good night's sleep. And then you wake up feeling refreshed and ready to take on the day. I love it. It is game changer. I'm not young enough to be able to just do what I did when I was younger. Don't do it anymore. I take Zbiotic. I'm feeling good today. And every time I have a Zbiotic before drinks, I notice a difference the next day. Even a night out, I can confidently plan on it and doing shows. I'm moving. So I gave Zbiotics a try when they first came to the show. I drank it uh, last night before this wedding, and I'm telling you, I'm top of my game right now. You wouldn't even be able to tell uh, that I was drinking last night. So this year, I'm going to form a more sustainable and better me podcasting, doing all this stuff. This is not a all or nothing approach. So you got to go to zbiotics.com slash big thing and use that code big thing. You check out for 15% off. And thank you to Zbiotics for sponsoring this episode and for all the good times. All right. Thank you to our friends over at Zbiotics and Vessi. Man, I'll tell you, I was just out of town and I love these Vessis. I love them, especially with the, the weather change. I was on the East Coast and rained a little bit. Couldn't tell on my feet. Loved it. Absolutely love these shoes. They slip on there. The airport, very easy in the airport. They make you take your shoes off on and off. And the time my shoes, well, these are the ties, but it's still, it's not like one of these things. It was, it was so, it was just a slip on. I love it. And Zbiotics took one right before I went out drinking with my friends the other night. And I feel good. Okay. Let's get to the next one. Here it is. All right. There's some Spider Man 4 news, guys. Spider Man. Let's talk about some Spider Man with Koi, but we still got him. Spider Man 4 rumor roundup. There's an update on Miles Morales and Kevin Feige's having a clash with Sony. This and more from comic book movie. Mark Cassidy, our buddy over there. We have some rumored updates on the fourth Spider-Man movie, including the possible debut of Miles Morales and exactly why Kevin Feige's glassing with Sony. I think I have an idea. Though a fourth Spider-Man movie featuring Tom Holland's take on the iconic webhead has yet to be officially announced, we know plans are in place for a follow-up to the mega-successful No Way Home. Now, if recent rumors are to be believed, the announcement delay could at least partially be down to Marvel and Sony being unsure of the best way to proceed with the story. And we have heard that Kevin Feige has clashed with Amy Pascal and Tom Rothman over the script. Daniel Rickman has shared some interesting updates. According to The Insider, Rothman is the one who is fighting with Feige over what to do with Spider-Man 4 and is determined to rush the sequel into development. Rothman has also said that he wants John Watts back at the helm while Feige would prefer another director to take over so Watts can move on to other projects. Rickman also claims whether the movie is a major multiverse adventure or a smaller scale street level story, the current plan is to introduce a live action take on Miles Morales. On the animation side of the Spider-Verse, Rickman believes that at least two more movies are planned in addition to Spider-Man Beyond the Spider-Verse. So that's a big report. That's a big report. And this is what I'm going to say when it comes to the Sony execs arguing with Feige. Have you seen Madam Web? <laughs> Have you watched those movies? Have you seen uh, Morbius? Have you watched your, your box office results? Well, but our argument would be that we're doing good Spider-Man stuff. Look at the animated stuff. But why are you rushing it out? You don't, you're not, you, why are you rushing it out? Stop trying to rush it out. Get it out when it's out. And it should be a street-level movie. It should not be another multiverse movie. It's, it's, it doesn't need to be. There hasn't been a Tom Holland street-level Spider-Man yet. People, And especially, especially if you're going to bring in Miles. Now, if you're going to... Is Miles only brought in through multiverse in the comics, too? Or is that just an animated thing? So in the comics, the origin of Miles takes place in a multiverse. Ultimate Spider-Man is, is separate from the mainstream 616. I doubt they'd introduce that concept. It would be very convoluted to suddenly yeah. be like, the Tom Holland you know. Like, that wouldn't work. 
But I do think that you need Tom to have his own story. Maybe introduce a kid named Miles Morales. But I wouldn't want the next Spider-Man movie to suddenly be like a duo movie because that would still not give Tom his one. So like maybe introduce who they cast, maybe have a, a you know a scene or two with a kid that's like fourteen and have that kid get to be Spider-Man. But I I'd be afraid of doing a a, a duo Spider-Man movie too soon. I mean I'd call the thing Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man. I'd make it smaller, uh, like yep. very intentionally. But Peter Parker should die if you want to bring Miles in, and that's complicated. What do you think, Winston? I think if you're gonna do it, then if you're if you're gonna introduce Miles and if you're trying to rush it like this, which first of all, don't rush it. What the hell is wrong with you? Like, slow down. I understand everybody's trying to make money, and I understand that you blew your wad on Morbius and and Madam Web, and you're probably shaking your boots a little bit about Venom: The Last Dance, just because you know, even though those first two movies did well, you have lost a lot of clout with folks outside of the Spider-Verse films. I think if you're going to introduce Miles because we need just Peter on his own, I think that it needs to be almost like a, a kind of a post-credit type situation. Mm -hmm. And in said post-credit, if you want to then tap into your Across the Spider-Verse films as the means of how, since that is supposed to be across all Spider-People, and we have seen Donald Glover now live action as... Uh, the Prowler, we have acknowledged that these are all, and we've also tapped into uh, the Venomverse at one point uh, with, with Beyond the Spider-Verse. So you, you're with the Cross the Spider-Verse. So we have established that the animated and the live action, anything doing with Spider-Man can have that. Then let that be the post credit that somehow that Miles that we've been following somehow maybe introduces the live action one or or Tom meets the animated one and he's like, Huh, is there someone like you here? Maybe. I don't know. Like th that do something like that, but do not just throw miles into this story because I agree. The one issue we've had is we have not allowed Peter to just simmer on his own. All right. I also think there's an element of uh rushing miles that's going to invalidate a lot of the specialness of miles being a legacy character. Yeah. Like uh -huh. it takes an entire movie for miles to trust fall. Like into the Spider-Verse is special because he's got to take a leap of faith. But we have to love the character to to be invested to that moment to matter. So I just worry if we rush him, we're going to invalidate Miles as a legacy character, which is the last thing you want to do. I am intrigued by the two more animated concepts that that was brought up because there was an interview where Amy Pascal said two more Spider Verse movies, and then it seemed like there was a bit of like oh, like uh, like that wasn't supposed to be announced, and then they said, oh, we of course mean. Beyond the Spider Verse and then Spider Man Four, like I think it was either Chris or Phil that like clarified that they meant that's what she meant by two. So I'm wondering if this report is assuming that she meant more, or if they're reading into that right. in the wrong direction. So I mean, I'd love if the reason that the delay on these movies happened was when writing the script for Beyond the Spider Verse, they realized they had room for a fourth. And I think next week, when the original release date was supposed to be for Spider Verse, it'd be cool if they announced the new release date. And what if they also said you're getting a fourth? But stop putting the cart before the horse. Don't announce a release date. If we're getting a fourth one, don't tell me when. I'd rather it come out when it's supposed to. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. I'd like to just give. Let's have a plan. I mean, it makes sense. Those movies are successful. You're doing the right thing. It makes sense to make more of them. But again, don't rush it, just to save your asses because you make stupid decisions on other movies. And when it comes, if I'm, if I'm them, if I'm if I'm Sony, I'm like, what does he want to do with Spider Man? Kevin Feige, let him do it. We're gonna make mo we're, it's, we're gonna make money on it. Let let him do it. What's he want to Every do? Every time, because what Beyond did two, uh, uh, Far From Home, I think did one. You mean you I mean remember. you mean Homecoming? Box office. Yeah, you mean Thunder, the first. The first one was Homecoming. Thunder, Thunder, what? For, so, no, no, no. So, so, so. Uh, uh, no it? way home. No way home made two. Yeah. Far From Home, I think made one. Okay. Or just shy of one. Right. And then Homecoming still did like eight hundred. Just Both? let did, let what? Feige and Disney do what he wants. Yeah. Well, look, I'm sure that they had a lot to say in those movies, also, right? And they probably had their notes, but it let but let them let them let him run, and if he's gonna say, look. Because I think, and it's that same thing, you're going to, to have him do a street level Spider-Man in a way that your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, as Koi said, and we haven't seen that yet from Holland. We haven't seen that type of story. And it, and it goes back to what we it's Spider-Man will, will get people in the theater. The Kung Fu Panda 4, right? Kung Fu Panda, Kung Fu, Kung Fu Panda, Kung Fu Panda, <laughs> it, it was... The fourth movie in a franchise, and usually at that point, they're spent when you're in a fourth movie of any franchise, you're spending you know 150, 200 million dollars. 
They cut costs. Now, they definitely hurt the quality a little bit, but they they cut costs and they made the movie for $80 million and they wound up making a lot of money. So it can be done. Now, granted, you know, it's an animated film that maybe it's it's different as far as salaries and everything too, because they cut Angelina Jolie, they cut Seth Rogen, they cut people, so they cut their costs there. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they're, the cutting of it actually, you know, obviously there was a lot that was missing. But you cut a lot of the cast already from No Way Home because he's, they, they don't remember him. So he's doing his own thing now. And you meet new actors who cost less. So you can do that and you should do that inside of this movie to, to give us a, a different level. But all right. Um, this is the it last. It also invalidates the end of No Way Home if they just I know. rush back to like to a multiverse. big spectacle. Because well, we, not only narratively have we not gotten that, but if everyone is back in his life, then it's kind of like Avengers Endgame ending with the snap and then Tony Stark being like, I'm all right. I'm okay. all right. Like, yeah, yeah. Just came, you know, so that's tricky. Yeah. Um, okay. So the last story, I have to bring this up because we talked about this and we did a reaction to it last week. The Crow remake. Everyone except us hates this trailer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was so shocked. I was so shocked. I thought everybody was going to think it was everybody hates this trailer. Everybody. Um, the original, wow. original The Crow director, even the original gr- director, denounces the remake. And now the trailer has 88,000 dislikes on YouTube. As the first trailer for Lionsgate remake on The Crow reaches 88,000 dislikes, the director of the original 90s adaptation has once again shared his thoughts on social media. Lionsgate released the first trailer for its upcoming re-adaptation, and everyone except the three idiots on Capes and Cows (laughs) hated this. Um, And the response was mixed. They said it was mixed. Okay. Though some were more willing than others to give an updated take on the material a chance, it's fair to say the majority of fans took issue with the decision to pretty much ignore the moody, gothic tone of the 90s film. The song choice was just flat out bizarre in favor of what basically became across as a generic supernatural action movie. Alex Proyas, who helmed the film, has previously shared his not-so-enthusiastic thoughts on the remake and has now returned to social media to comment on the trailer receiving over 50,000 dislikes. That number has now risen to 88,000. He says, I don't get any joy. From seeing negativity about any filmmaker's work, the director began, and I'm certainly the the cast and crew had all good intentions, as we do on any film. So it pains me to say that so it pains me to say any more on this topic, but I think the fans' response speaks volumes. The crow is not just a movie. Brandon Lee died making it, and it was finished as a testament to his lost brilliance and tragic loss. It is his legacy, that's how it should remain. The sheer amount of dislikes on the Crow's remake trailer might be a bad sign for how the movie will perform. Rashal Davis, who played a young girl named Sarah, who was cared by by Brandon Lee and Shelley Webster before they were murdered, recently spoke with TMZ about the first promo images. and Her initial reaction was, yuck. Davis made it clear she has no issues with Skarsgård's casting or ability, but feels his look captures... His look fails to capture the essence of Eric Draven, who was supposed to be a good man with a good soul. Davis described this version as dingy, dirty, grungy, suggesting that he looks, he looks more like the villains he should be fighting. The actress also took issue with the new movie's lack of diversity and feels that anyone other than a straight white male would have been a better casting choice, adding that Lionsgate might have gone out of their way to cast someone more closely resembling Lee out of respect. The synopsis read... Uh, you know. All right, anyway. So... What what the hell were we watching? Um, <laughs> but like, I mean, I guess for me, we all said the same thing. It did. It, I think they even say this. Trying something new. We thought. I mean, we we felt, and we also watched it in a void, which I like and would prefer to yes. do. We didn't have the time to listen to. Oh, look how bad this looks. Let me show you. If you come into a trailer with everyone saying this is the worst thing ever, it's going to be really hard to enjoy, no matter what. We actually got to have our own opinion. It so, did look. I mean, yeah. I'm happy with that. It did. Me too. It did, and I still. It does look like John Wick action type of thing. And does it look like a generic kind of supernatural action movie the way they summed it up? Kind of. Could it really? Could it work though? Yeah, maybe. Do I understand? Where obviously Alex Proyas, the actress who in, in the film, like, do their concerns? I do. I do understand their concerns, and I do understand that when you're so close to it, and the fact that that what how this legacy for Brandon Lee and how close they are to it. I understand everything that they're saying. And I understand that if you're comparing, I love that movie. I love the movie. I mean, shoot, I've talked about professor crow. I love that movie, the the original. And it's not, I actually like that. They're not trying to do the same movie because I don't want them to try it. Cause I got a good one already. I got that movie already. And this is just a different version. And this movie, look, I'm not a Rupert Sanders guy. I think, I, I think he's not a great director, but, and we went into that trailer going, 
I don't know about this. And I said, oh, this is going to be an, an interesting action film. I, I think most people are watching that, though, saying, how dare they do this to the original, which is, I think, you know, warranted, I understand. Uh, I just think it's it's really tricky to... I understand where everyone is coming from, but I think we went into it going, I don't have a lot of interest. Oh, now I have some interest. And I think a lot of people are going, why would you do this? Like, how could you do this? And I get where everyone is coming from, but I also think that they've made sequels. And I, and I feel like nobody's addressing that. Like, this isn't the first new Crow... I've never seen the sequels because of I I consider the first one so good. Yep. But I, I don't I don't think this is the first time someone else has embodied the crow. Maybe it's because it's Eric Draven again. Maybe it's because like they're trying to do that. But it, it seems interesting that no one ever spoke out against the other ones. Or maybe I just didn't hear it because now we have more connected. Maybe because they're just maybe it's less because there was a sequel to it and I don't know and not the original. I'm not sure. Winston, what do you think? I mean. I don't have the connection to this right. film that everybody that loved it from the 90s has. So for that reason, I genuinely went in with a blank slate, saw the trailer, and I was like, that looks like fun. That looks that looks like a story that could be interesting to get into. That looks like some intense action. Um, but again, I can understand, like, the, the only way that I could describe it in my own terms, I remember specifically what those original... Uh, live action Ninja Turtle films, especially the first one. Uh, I love Secret of the Ooze, but like the first one is so well done that then when they reintroduced the one with Megan Fox and these monstrosities, I was like, bro, absolutely not. And then right. I saw the films and I didn't love them. Mm -hmm. They've grown on me a little bit now, but they, I, I, I get that they're supposed to be mutants, but like part of what makes them interesting is they're not that ridiculous looking right and so i can see if people are like the aesthetic of this original film is this and you've gone so far from it that it, it, it it's disturbing i i can understand why people are upset but i'm still excited for this because that looked like it was going to it even if it looked generic like bro there are generic hamburgers out there and sometimes a generic hamburger is actually pretty damn good well there you go guys <laughs> looks listen we, we did it all here today in a short period of time. So what do you think about everything we talked about? What do you think about the Crow trailer? Did you think it stinks or did you think it was fine? Um, I do think that it's not going to do very well. I'll tell you that. It is, I, I agree. I don't think it's going to do very well at all. 88,000 people committing to disliking something does not bode well for a box office. No, no and, the budget and it doesn't just seem like they're doing it for, you know, political reasons or anything, too. They just seem like they're just that most people that dislike this thing just think they're so they're just this is not the crow that we that we fell in love with. And it just doesn't it does. And I think because both of what Brandon Lee did to make that look so iconic and even what we talk about the wrestler sting, right? Whether or not he says it's the crow or not, it was the crow. Razor Ramon said so. Um, but that image of that character, of it's like changing Batman at this point, right? Uh -huh. It's like changing the look of a of a. And I know that the crow and Batman are, di are different as far as iconic yeah, stuff. You see what, what I'm saying. saying? It's just like you're changing the look of it. So I get that. I understand that. I just figured that if they're going to go, and I don't love the look of it, but it's like, I just said, well, let me watch what the movie is itself. Because I do feel like those people, though, that have hit that dislike button, that I do feel like it's the same thing. If they went, they're not even going to give it a chance. And that's why it's yeah, that's what shooting. I mean. Like eighty-eight thousand yeah. is so strong. I doubt those people are going to give twenty dollars to to do this thing they already don't like. And like the the new Roadhouse is very, 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 very different from the old Roadhouse. But I'd rather Jake Gyllenhaal not try to be Patrick Swayze. I'd rather a movie take some leaps where it's not trying to do the same thing. But if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. I like the new Roadhouse, but it doesn't feel like the old one. I think that's a strength. But whether people give it a chance or not. Oh, who knows? All right. All right. So I want to thank my panel for being here today. Winston, where can I find you? You can find me at the Swaggy Blurred uh, over on all the platforms, man. Um, yeah, I've got uh, some stuff that I'm working on and a and, uh, potential surprise soon. But I, I want to let me let me wait before I talk about that. All right. And Coy? Find me on all socials at Coy Jongro, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter. And you can find me in L.A. jealous of Winston being in Boston. All right, and somebody's doing lawn stuff and everything else, too. So we got to see. All right, everybody, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Hit that button, like, and subscribe. Do all that. Appreciate you, and we'll see you on the flip side.
Bye.